Now that we know the basics about control charts for variables, let's take a look at how to put them together. So in this lecture, we'll talk about selecting quality characteristics to monitor and our subgroup size or our sample size given information about a process problem. We'll figure out how to calculate averages, action lines, and warning lines for an x-bar or mean and R chart. And we'll take all that data and construct an x-bar or R chart and determine state of process control. We have eight main steps for creating a pair of x-bar or mean and R charts. And you usually see them together because when you're looking at data, it's a good idea to have an idea of what the average is and what the range is at any point in time. Remember talking about precision and accuracy. You can have something that's highly accurate, so the mean is right on where we want it, but have a huge range. So that's why it's, look, it's important to look at them together to determine, okay, what does our process control look like and how much variation do we have in our process? So the first step in creating a pair of these charts is to select our quality characteristic. And this comes from knowing about the process problem. The quality characteristic is the variable that you're monitoring. So do you want to measure temperature? Do you want to measure pressure? Do you want to measure flow? Do you want to measure mixing speed? What is the quality that you're trying to monitor? And what do you need to take a look at to make sure you're within your desired control? The next thing you want to do after you figure out your quality characteristic is choose your subgroup size. So this is how many samples you want to average together in each sampling group. This is normally between 4 and 10. 10 is rather high. Once you get above 10, you start using a standard deviation chart instead of a range chart. The more your test costs to run, the lower your subgroup size is typically going to be. So if you have a high cost and especially destructive test where you can't put your product back on the line, you're going to have a smaller subgroup size. In this class, we usually use a subgroup size of between 3 and 5. After you've selected your subgroup size, so how much data you're going to lump into one point, you're going to collect your data and you're going to plot it on the chart. This is sort of a first pass technique to see immediately if anything stands out as alarming. So we don't have any limits on our chart yet. We don't even know what the average is. We're just seeing how much variation is in our process right now. Then we're going to calculate the mean and range for each sample. So this is our X bar for each sample and R for each sample. After we have that, we'll take all of our means and ranges for each sample and calculate the mean and range for all data. So that's x double bar and, x and r bar. Notice that the bar over our x and our r indicates some kind of average. So when we have the average of our averages, that's why we have the double bar on our x. The range is not an average. It's, well, a range. It tells you how much spread is in your data. When you're taking the average of your ranges, that's when you have the bar over the R. That's indicating you have an average. Then, after you've got those averages, you're going to calculate your action lines and your warning lines for both chart, and you'll do those separately. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. When you have your action lines and your warning lines, then you post that data, as well as your average lines, to your control chart. Then you take a look at where your data are compared to the average line, the action line, and the warning lines, and look at the state of process control. It's also a good idea at this point to check for any calculation errors. If your action lines, let's say, are inside your warning lines, something has gone wrong. Also, if your action lines are, and warning lines are nowhere near your process data, there's probably a calculation error in there somewhere. You would expect your process data, most of it anyway, to be inside the action and warning lines, or at least spread around the action and warning lines, not bunched up near one versus another. 
To calculate the average central lines for your x bar and r charts, you use these formulas shown here. Here we have summation notation. That's what this big sigma means right here. We're summing all of our subgroups from i equals 1, where i is just the number of subgroups you happen to be on, to k, the total number of subgroups you have. So let's say you had five subgroups. You would have five x bars that you'd be adding up here, and then you would divide by the number of subgroups, which in this case is five. That would give you your average of your subgroup averages. So x double bar. Keep in mind, what you're adding here when you're calculating x double bar is the actual average of each subgroup. So if you were to add your data points together, that's not x bar. You want to calculate x bar first before you try calculating x double bar. And so remember, you calculate x bar for each particular subgroup. So x double bar is the average of your averages. R bar here is the average of your ranges. Again, we have summation notations where we're just summing the ranges we have from i equals 1 to k, the total number of our subgroups. Again, if we had five subgroups, we'd have five terms in our sum. Once we have our averages, we can use them to calculate our action limits and our warning limits. Here we see the formulas for x bar charts. So we need not only x double bar, but also r bar, because this is dependent on the variation in our data we have. Our UAL and our LAL are our upper and our lower action limits, respectively. So here we have this constant A2. A2 is in Appendix B in your book. It's just a constant and it depends on the subgroup size. So it's going to change with your subgroup size. If you have a subgroup of 2, for example, your A2, that constant will be a different value than if you had a subgroup size of 5. So keep in mind that when you're looking up your values in Appendix B. Your upper and lower warning limits, or UWL and LWL, are calculated in the same way as your upper and lower action limits, except for this time, you're multiplying your A2 times R bar term by 2 thirds. And that's because if you remember back to our previous lecture on control charts, our action limits were set at 3 times our standard error and our warning limits were set at two times our standard error. Our A2 and our R bar term basically is three times our standard error. So that's why we're multiplying two thirds to get down to the warning limit from the action limit. When you look at your X bar chart, this is what you should see with no data on it. So this is your average right here, this black line. The orange lines here and here are symmetrical about your average line and they are inside your action lines here and here, the red lines. So keep in mind that symmetry should appear in a control chart for your process mean, x bar. If they're not symmetrical, take a look at your calculations and make sure that everything is being calculated properly. Now let's look at the limits for our R charts. So we have our upper action and our lower action limits again, as well as our upper warning and our lower warning limits. This time though, we just use our average range, our R bar, and we're multiplying them times constants that we get also in Appendix C. So this is in the back of your book in Appendix C. We have different constants for our different limits. This is based on three times our standard deviation. So anything outside of our standard deviation, if you remember, that's about 99% of our total data. That's where these subscripts come from. This is looking at somewhere between two and three times our standard deviation. So we have a little bit lower on our warning limit, our upper warning limit, and a little bit higher on our lower warning limit. When you post your 
process average range on your range chart, this black line, your warning limits and your action limits here shown in the orange and red respectively may not be symmetrical around your center line. And that's because if they were symmetrical around your center line, for some cases, you would have negative limits on your range, which is, of course, physically impossible. So that's why your upper and lower warning limits may not be quite symmetrical, depending on what your process average is. For practical purposes, the lower warning limit and the lower action limit for range charts is sometimes just set to zero. Because if you think about it, the lower your variation your process is, the more consistent it is. And that's a good thing. So you don't necessarily want to take action when you're near your lower warning limit and your lower action limit. That can be a good thing. It means your range is very, very small. All right, so now we know how to get those lines. We know how to put everything together on our control chart. So let's take a look at an example of constructing an X-bar or average chart. First thing we do is collect our data and we take a look at it. Do we see anything that's worrying? From the first pass, no, not really. Everything is pretty much within a general range. We don't have any points that are obvious outliers and we don't have any odd trends like our data constantly increasing or our data constantly decreasing. The next thing we want to do is figure out, all right, what's our process average? So we have that posted here. Normally you would co construct the entire control chart before taking a look at the control chart as a whole, but here I'm just showing you where the process average is with respect to our data. So again, it doesn't look like we have any worrying trends. Our data is not lying all below our average, which would be impossible. That would be a calculation error in this point. So we're seeing that our data kind of goes up and down around this line, which is what we would expect for an average line. Now let's put our warning limits and our action limits on and take another look at our data. Assuming this data is calculated correctly and our limits are calculated correctly, our process is in pretty good control. We don't have any odd patterns to look out. We don't even have anything outside of our warning limits. Never mind our action limits. Everything is pretty much clustered around our process average. So this is great. This means our process is in good control and we just need to maintain what we're doing to keep this level of process control. 